So here we are with uh, another Teotihuacan section. And I want to outline uh, the idea of line quality with respect to the Teotihuacan artworks. And, um, and if you haven't watched the other videos, Teotihuacan is from uh, like, I think it's 150 BC to 700 AD, um, lasted about 800 years. And it has this incredible apartment complex nature to it. And there's all these artwork, these paintings, even though we've only excavated 2% of, of the, uh, the apartment compounds. And so today I wanna kind of discuss the idea of line quality. And, and line quality is something that changes um, our, our appreciation of it, our sensitivity to it uh, changes through, over the generations um, and due to different cultural needs, right? We can pay attention to different qualities of, of line. And maybe um, in the age of, of reproduction, in this kind of age of the simulacra or, um, or, or when, when things get re redone over and over again, how do we think about line quality within that kind of setup? So I'm just talking about like the internet and you have a reproduction that's a little bit fuzzy and then it gets cleaned up and then it gets flipped and then, and does that matter? Does it, where, what kind of sensitivity, sensitivity is lost versus the ones that um, are gained, you could say, instead of just um, being derogatory about this effect, let's say that, that something else is gained from, from that. Um, then, uh, yeah, so, so, so how is line quality different now than it was then? And how is our appreciation of it or sensitivity to it? Or, or what does it signal? What, does, what, what do different um, effects of line quality signal for, for us as, as humans in our various cultures? So um, to break down line quality, so, so normally like line quality, if you learn about line quality in art history, right? Because this is our, our introductory class to art history as well as um, Mexican art history. So line quality often is introduced as, as to dark to light. Um, you know, make your line heavier and make it lighter and more delicate. And it's given these different uh, reverberations of, of meaning. Um, so for example, like even in, in this, like down here, we have a painting from Lascaux, 10,000 BC, I, I think. And we could look at the line quality of this animal that somebody made deep within a cave from from memory, right, in the dark. And uh, and the line is, uh, it flows and it gets thinner and then thicker and, and maybe it's slightly more angular there where someone maybe picked up whatever device they were using or stopped blowing through whatever uh, pipe that they were blowing the paint through or however, however it was made. Um, and then if we have something like Teotihuacan here, this is a painting on a, on a fresco and we have this kind of more loose uh, remnant of the hand. And um, so yeah, that's just kind of what I'm talking about is, is there's a quality of line. And so, so even though this doesn't strike a line immediately, there's the, the line of the cutting that occurred, right? When someone cut, they cut with a line in mind, but they also cut with a shape in mind. So, so the line talks about what's on both sides of the line, right? Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to continue to open up our our sense of of looking, and then this is a a piece that we'll talk about. It's a it's a relief form or kind of an inscription in stone, a kind of tablet idea. And then on the right, I I have like I want to talk about tracing and memory and kind of like how we follow a template when we go to do something. So like if you're you're a child and you learn not to touch the radiator. Um, you can look at the radiator and, and you have a memory of, of how you'll trace your behavior. Maybe you could think of it like that. But like if I go to trace a map, um, I'm going to pay attention to the thing that I'm tracing and I'm going to pay attention to the thing that I'm drawing and my mind will 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 shift between those things. And that, that'll be evident in the line quality if, if we if we want to pay attention to that, if we want to become sensitive to to what these lines are. So, so this is a map that's drawn. And then and then I have like a, a copy book uh, from the Renaissance, late middle ages, I think. It's like a, a copy book of how to write text in, in Europe, um, how to write a, a font, how to write a letter or a capital letter and, and how do we follow these? And culturally, like how much leeway do we have to be independent within a system of rules, right? And Teotihuacan is an excellent place to deal with 
um, the arrival of the state in human psychology and the idea of, of um, taboo and rules and, and, and where we can move within, within a, a communal structure that's going to live harmoniously together, right? What kind of, uh, what kind of pressures of, on conformity are there? So how would that be represented in line quality? And that's really exciting. So, so I'm, I'm trying to give us the tools to, to, to leave, um, oh, that's a pretty line or an ugly line to, to leave this kind of pedantic, uh, very, um, I don't know, that's like a way of looking at, at a line, right? Oh, it, you could just say, oh, it's subjective. I like it or I don't. Well, you know, what if it tells a story? Sure, you might not like the story, but let's let's read the story. Maybe it has a, a you know, maybe it's a cool story, like this line tells us. And then in the middle, I have my my constant thread that I like to keep going with. This is is that learning about art is is about learning about seeing, right? Learning how to look. Um, the famous John Berger has a lot of publications about the ways of seeing, and um, and so there's this idea of of looking at at animals. So let's go ahead and. And, and move through Teotihuacan a little bit. So if, you know, when I first started looking at birds in the chaparral here in Monterey County, um, I couldn't I, I couldn't figure out, you know, the differences really. I definitely didn't know the names. And then, and these pictures are meant to help you see the differences, right? So they're, 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 they're obvious, but a lot of times in nature, it's, it's harder to tell um, if these are the same bird or different birds. And so as we begin to, to be able to name the identifying characteristics of small birds that are similar in color in the, in the trees um, from far away, we start to, the, the space of looking at the world starts to open up and, and it starts to become very rich and it, it starts, starts to lose a kind of even quality. Um, like imagine that you're driving along the highway and you see a blur of trees. It just seems like a blur of trees. But once you know that that's an oak or that's a maple, it, it kind of starts to slow down and separate in space. So here's a bush tit on the, on the left and a wren tit on the right. And, you know, seeing could be thought of as caring also, like caring about myself and caring about what I'm looking at to give it time to, to identify it, to give it a name. So the, the oak trees are a great example where we live. So that's a bush tit on the, on the right. And um, this is the example of oak leaves, right? W what's the difference between an interior live oak and a, and a, and a coastal live oak? And, um, and they're a great example in relation to birds. Like a, a bird watcher often doesn't need to see the bird. They could hear the bird to know what kind. Or, or identifying characteristics might not be simply like photo generated or, or still generated like oh it was high in a tree or it flew quickly or how did it fly or how did it behave and um and with trees it's the same right maybe white oaks lose their leaves and and valley oaks don't or oregon oaks oregon white oaks lose their, their leaves and um so what time of year is it or what is the bark or what is the shape of the of the tree so i'm just talking about honing our, our visual skills in terms of identifying line quality so so this has a a quality to it right this edge this line um i don't want to like harp too much on difference between line shape and edge but let's just let's just call it line for now so so some bird watchers you know in the distance can just see the shadow of a form and determine the, the kind of bird it is there's a sensitivity to that um so th this is a, I, when I first learned that these, that there are names for these shapes, I was delighted. The, the idea that, that this is called um, obovate, right? That's so cool that that shape has a name. And then you can start to see that shape in the world. Um, you know, there's, there's words like oval and circle and square that we learn, but what about or, orbicular, right? Or lyrate, there's a beautiful shape. Um, or deltoid, or chordate, or ablancelot. Ablance um, so yeah, so it's just like, what, what does naming do to characterizing these shapes? And so in, in Teotihuacan, there's this guy who does this research that um, 
uh, or several people actually, that this is a reproduction on the left of, of a painting in Teotihuacan. And then, um, well, it's two different reproductions, right? Or, or, or fax meals or, or copies that help us see it more clearly, right? That bring out whatever identifying characteristics the, the academic or the researcher is trying to figure out. So they decided black and white might help them see it, might help people understand this. Or if we, or if we bring it down to three colors, that might help people understand it. And so that's interesting in and of itself. But um, just to tie back into nature and identifying, there's some research about the the, the dog uh, candids, canines, the candids, <laughs> the um, canines that lived during the time of Teotihuacan, and there was the the Mexican wolf and the coyote, and they think maybe the dog was bred with the wolf and and are these all coyotes or are they all dogs? And um, how do we how do we identify that? And once we start to do that, maybe we'll see um, we'll see a little more in what we're looking at, right? I'm just trying to um, engender a sense that that there there's always there is always more to to see in something, and um, and that can be exciting, and in different ways to look at it. So. Um, Maybe I'll just, in case you haven't seen any of the Olmec, I mean, the Teotihuacan paintings before, I guess it's worth it to just, uh, I'll show a couple, but really, if you want to see the, the the introduction, you can see a full spread. If you if you click on the introduction video for this series, um, there's a, like, I show several paintings, but if you, if you haven't seen that, I just want to give you a, a sense of what they look like right now. They're on plaster. Um, yeah, so this is, this is what we're, this is what we're dealing with. So we'll come back, we'll come back to this, to, to, to spending some real time looking at, at, at some paintings, but I want to keep going with this thread of, of, um, of looking and take that to the idea of the trace. So on the right, you have a tracing of, um, of Nantucket Sound from the 1800s, maybe 1900s. And then on the left, you have um, a cartoon. And so when was tracing paper invented or, or what is tracing paper? What is the need for tracing paper? That's that's interesting, right? Like why, why, why make tracing paper? Why did humans need that? Um, but the cartoon on the left is gonna produce a very different effect in, it, in its final, um, in its final result, right? So in the, in the Renaissance, we've talked about this before a little bit, but they, you make little holes, you, you make a drawing, then you you outline the drawing with tiny holes and you take charcoal and put it in a little uh, bag so that when you pounce, the charcoal can come through and it goes through the dots onto your surface that you're then going to paint your fresco on. So it leaves a, a stenciled. But um, then when you go to paint on that, you're 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 following an image that's pre-existing that has that been affected by this process, by this reproduction process. Now, what kind of difference in line quality is that going to produce to something like a, a tracing paper? And so to my eye, I, I think it's fascinating that you can see if you if you decide to let yourself maybe um, that the person who's drawing this is paying attention to what's underneath and they're paying attention to what they're drawing. And in a way, what they're drawing is um, is fading in their in their mind a little bit as they're trying to focus on what they're tracing. So in other words, they're, they maybe they 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 pay a little less attention to the thing that they're making because they're trying to follow something, right? So when you're when you're following, if you're playing tennis and you're constantly following somebody's lead, you might lose track of your form, your sense of 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 self, and where you stand and how you're going to to um to win, right? And that's a poor metaphor, but I just came up with that. So but I think you get the idea. So, so this 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 kind of clunky quality could be an effect of of the process by which it's 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 being it's being traced. Um, so on the left here, you have this um, this is like a modern way of tracing things, and um, it's like a very affordable thing that's sold. That's kind of happened during my lifetime. These these lights that you can put a drawing on, on and it it reflects it larger, and you can trace it. And then on the right, you have a, another picture of how the cartoon works, this Renaissance idea of, uh, of, of making a reproduction of an, of an image. So there's this little wheel with spikes on it, and you can run that along your drawing. 
and it'll it'll leave holes so the light can pass through but then charcoal can also pass through so so the idea is like the lines would be limited by this device right the same way as language is limited by its its structure and what it can express maybe depending on the language so um i mean in terms of like uh you know like mandarin versus french or i'm just uh throwing something out there but like the difference in in languages might structure certain feelings and uh and ways of talking about things this is similar this is a device for transferring an image onto a wall and that might limit what gets transferred and what, what gets lost and what gets found so here i have um receipts right so on the right you have a receipt from a um from a shoe and apparel store and let's give this some patience like sure that's just someone's handwriting but it's done in a way where we know it's a it's a copy it's a copy that in fact was made um during the act of writing it right it's not like someone made it then handed it to someone then they made a cartoon and then it was transferred it's like this instantaneous remnant of someone's hand and, and the carbon copy does something. So this is carbon paper and this carbon copy is, is a method of reproducing things. And it leaves things lighter or dark. It, 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 it allows us to see script in a particular way. And it leaves it faded. And we, we have the feeling that we're actually seeing the, what the person wrote and what was given. And we, and we did actually, but we didn't, we're not seeing what they saw. We're seeing what's underneath what they saw. So if we if we move on with this idea into into the cave paintings, the the stretch I'm making is that the, how close are you to the thing that you are mimicking? The, like right, like if a if a kid mimics how to walk um, and practices every day, they're very close to their model that they're following. Um, in the case of the cave paintings, the, the model for is is in the mind's eye, right? And the same thing with the kid. Like we we could imagine that someone's tracing something in front of them, but but they have a whole history of making things themselves. And so and 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 the collective of how they were taught to to make a thing plays a part. So if you're if you're taught to um to, to draw the 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 letter in a specific way you, you're going to bring all that and there's certain rules that you've been taught oh it's not it's not pretty to do it this way this doesn't fit with our style that's their style that's not our style or, or you know whatever kind of internal conversation becomes so my point with the cave paintings is is how far away is the mind's eye um from the moment of making right so so if someone's keeping this image of a real animal or a fantastic animal um and they're 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 making a reproduction of it. So you could think of of drawing and making art as as part of that that scenario. So when we get to Teotihuacan, here's an image. So let's address this image with the tools that I've been discussing, right? And this is hard. This is not. Um, I don't want this to seem um, like a super easy idea. If, if we've been looking at lines, we've all been looking at lines our whole life, but without realizing it maybe, or without making things, you know, um, it's a sensitive thing I'm, I'm talking about here. So what do these lines look like? How do they look different from this line? How do they look different from this line? Do these look traced? If there is an image in someone's mind, how strict or how much does this look like it? Um, does this feel like a stencil? Um, this sweep of this curve that intersects this at an angle is very specific to this moment of making this. Um, the fact that the line is made up from the background means that someone made a line by making a flat shape. What kind of juggling of mind is that, right? To, to paint shapes um, like this so that the contours are coming from the background means you imagined the edge of the thing by the, by the shape next to it. So you go to describe um, a thing, instead of drawing the contour, you're gonna draw a puzzle piece. That's a very um, complex way of thinking about the visual plane. And it takes, um, 
it takes a lot of a lot of mind power to be able to do that. So maybe I'll I'll leave a I'll leave this one for now. But this is just just the start of 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 how you could you could start to just pay attention to the edge of things and a line in in an artwork. Um, you know, you could start to say like, does it matter that this is here? Would it matter if it was an inch over? Is that not the point of this? Um, so this is an incredible piece of art from Teotihuacan that we have inscribed in, in this stone. And so we have this, um, we have a symmetry down the middle, but it's a very relaxed symmetry, right? And this is not a culture, we're not talking about a culture that, um, that, uh, you know, when we look at a, a planned out city of close to 200,000 people on a specific axis with a four mile boulevard and a cultural Mecca and um, a, a trade capital in, in, in precious goods, maybe. Um, we're not talking about some, like, this isn't on accident, what this, not that anything's ever on accident, actually, that's a good question, the way I just set that up, but my point is that they could have made this, right, we could imagine that they could have developed a method for making this exact, so the hand is in this, so even though this thing is carved in a hard, a relatively hard surface compared to pen and paper or ink and, and fresco, there's an incredible lightness of touch. Like this is the zoom in of the foot here. And we have the, the heel just lightly hanging over the, the shoe object. And this kind of description of cloth maybe. And in, and in here we have, um, you know, it's all slightly different from one side to the next. So what kind of tracing was this? And, and I want us to make the leap, not necessarily like a tracing, like someone put down a blueprint paper and traced onto this stone, but what kind of tracing from the mind, from the mind's eye was, was this, right? Um, how is this thing made uh, um, intellectually and emotionally? So here we have on the left, this is, it's still loose. Like if we look at the, the feathers of this bird creature, um, you know, this, this looks more like a like a print, like a mold, and less like something hand drawn, but it's still relaxed. It's not um, the the form it's following does not seem so strict. But who's who's to know? Because then we could talk about that's a very good thing to talk about. Actually, like what what would reflect a strict structure? Can we tell the amount that's not allowed? the moves that aren't allowed to be made by the individual artists in some guild or group of artists and trends, right? Like what, what can't I do and what can I do? Is it okay to put four feathers instead of two? Or is it okay for this bird to have a uh, wingspan shorter than length or, you know, whatever rules were, were determined. And on our right, we have the, the detail of, of one of the pieces that I already, already showed that had the trees in the bottom. And um, this just strikes for me of the, the, the movement, the gesture of the hand, that the trace of the body is left in this mark in a really um, tangible way. The hand has been left. So now we're getting into uh, the topic of touch with respect to this tracing idea, right? So I'm carrying us through this visual acuity with these birds of, of being able to, to sharpen what we can and want to pay attention to and what kind of identifying characteristics we give it. And then on, on these parallel tracks, I'm trying to talk about the trace and the touch, um, this like visual touch. So there's the, the hand is in this, so you can see that. And um, that's very different than seeing a, a print or a, a repetitive print pattern feeling, which does not, does not have that. Um, the way this mark just comes over the edge here over and over again, that has a particular pace to it. Um, when we come to, to something like Matisse on the left, these are Matisse's cutouts. Um, I don't know exactly how these were made. I've seen some pictures. I haven't researched it that much. But, um, you know, like I said in the beginning of this section, is, is that when you cut something, you're, you're following a line in your mind and you're, you're watching this form form through cutting. 
And so the, these, these shapes are determined by the tool, the implement, right? This, okay, make a snip, make another snip as I turn the paper. Maybe don't stop snipping until here. Um, these look like multiple pieces put together. It's a little confusing to see how this worked, but my my point is that the, the forms are conditioned by how the line was was conceived. And there's a playfulness to the Matisse work. And these stars from Teotihuacan, like, what kind of lines are these? These are unbelievable for for 2,000 years ago. In my book, this is just a, a shocking rendition of a geometric form known as a star. Right? I mean, a star, um, for a star to be as lazy and relaxed and look like pillows in the sky is a really special human condition to bring it there, right? They brought they brought geometric star and orientation and points and, 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 you know, what is this? Like just, just to, 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 to show that shape. And for lack of a better word, like a cartoon to kind of give it a anthropomorphic cushy vibe is, uh, is really fascinating. And it, and it sparks of, of this a little bit. And so that's a kind of touch. That's a, that's a, there's a, there's a human touch on the shape and on the edge of the shape and, and on rendering this. This is an installation shot of, of this Matisse painting that we saw the detail of, I think. Um, within this, and I'll touch on this in another section, there's a kind of nostalgia for utopia in my, in my mind, right? There's a kind of fun, utopic, um, kind of exalting in beauty, right? A kind of indulgence maybe. So now if we come down to these the Teotihuacan paintings, let's just break these apart a little bit in terms of line. Um, so here, this line does not seem like a positive move. This is a negative move. The background seems to be creating this line. So someone laid down a positive move and that created the line around it. Um, I've talked about this before with color, but imagining this line um, a priori right to like to imagine how to draw this beforehand and then lay it down is a, is a complicated procedure the way this all fits together but it all seems equal at the same time right everything's kind of given an equal amount of attention maybe I'm just talking it out together. I haven't talked about this piece in terms of line um, like this before. So I want this to just be an example of somebody with a lot of experience making lines and looking at lines and different artwork, talking about a piece and how I, I approach it when I see it um, and, and want to think about line quality. There's definitely like a general evenness. So, so what's nice about the way I'm talking about this is it's taking it away from, oh, you know, light to dark. Um, what about, like, yeah, what does it mean for line quality to be even? And it, and so, like, I mean, maybe I'm saying edge quality even, however you want to, you want to semantically break up the idea of line and edge, but it's, it's at least um, worth noting how this thing feels like a puzzle. And then if we look on the right, this is super relaxed, right? Boom, boom. Like, it seems like even maybe the original, if there was an original drawing, might have had three feathers here, but the artist just got to this point and one feather works or, 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 or is it something, is this a shape that somebody made a thousand times? And then they made the final one, right? Like practicing some classical piece and then you finally perform it, right? Is this, are these performative lines? Like, are they show off or they like, do they flourish? I don't think so. They, they don't feel, they don't have any of that kind of like, like show offness. They're, they're very classy artworks, right? It's like just enough. There's just enough line to do the job in this, in this situation, right? I'm going to stop drawing this many, this is enough feathers to say that there are a hundred feathers on this bird. Um,
So these are two different ways of, of really thinking about a line, right? Again, we have this kind of like, this is totally, so this is not a puzzle mentality in the, in the way that, um, that we were talking about with the last piece. This feels much more, the, the, the red, the red line, um, feels much more linear. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like we have a lot, like, this feels drawn and, and that's complicated even because even though it feels drawn, like the lines are just drawn on a surface, they're actually the reverse, right? So they're someone, it's hard to tell what happened with this, but it, it seems as if the background is coming through and someone painted on the, the uh, or did someone fill in the background and they drew on the red line. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just kind of through looking at the timing and the process of how it's made. I'm also talking about these lines, but these lines, so let's see if we can all see this together. These lines look like someone drew them. They don't, they forget about the fact that they might be the background. And this is super subtle and you don't have to care about this, but it's just, it's part of the work. And so I like to look at it. So this, you don't forget that the line is part of the background, right? These, I talked about this in the other class, but it, all these pieces, all the pieces of the clothes feel like they're just kind of floating in space. And there's like a ghost is wearing, wearing all this, right? Moving through space. And they, if he shook, all these things would just kind of fall down. Um, with with this kind of line, you don't have a similar sense. There's still like an empty sense, right? But it's all connected or something. The whole outfit is chain mail. Um, and so the line quality is what's is what's doing that. So that's a very that's a very sensitive read of line quality that I'm that I'm giving this. Um, this one, so this is a good one to just look at. These edges have been heightened, you could say, or they've been added, they've been added, they've been given extra value, a low value, a dark value. So they've been like inscribed extra, right? So that's a, that's a kind of line quality where they, it wasn't enough just to have this value shift of this pink to this lighter pink. There was a desire to to accentuate this, um, and here we have an excellent drawing with shape of a slightly darker value than the background for a positive um, for a positive object. The uh, the way the talons intersect in the the hands of the claws of this net jaguar from Teotihuacan, and this is subtle, right? It's a dark red to 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 a very like a, a very a, a, a subtle value shift. Um, a really stunning image. Um, for those of you in the class, you, you get to we we watch these these videos that talk about classical music and, and a sensitivity to the to the linear element of playing through a through a musical piece. And I draw that correlation to, to line here. Um, here again, we have this, this remnant of the body, the sway of the hand going back and forth on this plaster. And, and um, you know, what sense of tracing is, is on this? Um, th this, this is interesting. These marks here remind me of, so if someone says to go, um, go nail up a, a panel, uh, go put a wall up, right? If, you, if you've ever seen a construction site, you see a piece of plywood or a piece of sheetrock, it has nails, there's different codes, nails every six inches or nails every 12 inches. And the, the contractor says, go, go, go nail that off every six inches. Um, you have an option there. If you've done it a lot, you might not need to, to have some kind of a, a tool that will transcribe every six inches, right? So you could hold up a stick, mark it every six inches and use that as you nail it off to get some kind of precision. Um, you know, does this look like this? Does this look like it was traced from a rubric? Or is someone just freewheeling, free forming within within some set of parameters? Um, another way to think about it is like while they were marking this, is it like those TV shows where the surgeon is is just talking about his coffee while he's doing this incredible thing? Like are these are these moments of quietude? a peacefulness and kind of focus, or is this just like a bunch of people all together that have been doing this 
you know, they, they're really good at it and they're, and they're just painting these trees down on, down on this wall. And all of that could be surmised from the quality of the line, or at least like talked about. This one's a little bit harder to, to get at. One, because it's a reproduction, it's a fast meal. And the other is um, it's got a lot of color. And so the, the color obfuscates the line in a way, right? Or brings about different properties. But we definitely have more of like a, a flat layered, like something has been laid down. Right, like kind of a not necessarily stencil, but at least um, not like textile. I'm not sure what the right word for it would be, but inlay maybe, or it doesn't have a draw. Uh, really, a draw. It does have a drawn feel. It's very difficult to describe the complexity of this piece when you have stars like this and a, and a shape like this and a repetitive but slightly different group of feathers. It, it's um, miraculous piece of human uh, remains that we have here. And then if we come to something like the Etruscan tombs, which which the um, Teotihuacan art reminds me of a lot, uh, you know, this is the here line is contour, right? This is a really classic. And so the Etruscans were there in just like 100 BC, I think before the, the Romans came to Italy. And I've drawn from these in Tarquinia and different parts of Italy. And um, they're, they're shocking in their, their uh, emotional sensitivity. Um, but I'm just kind of pointing out here how the line describes the inside and the outside of something. And then the color follows suit, right? There's not, there's not like, um, you know, these play a different thing. These act as silhouette. Um, but we, we, we don't have what's happening in Teotihuacan. This is a detail of a Teotihuacan painting. Um, Teotihuacan, it's far more wishy-washy when a, a color play, a colors go out of their contours, contours become fields, fields become contours. It's a, um, it's a totally different sensibility. This is Teotihuacan also. Here we have um, kind of what I was talking about with that earlier piece where it feels more like a textile or this kind of like something that's been laid down, maybe lace or, yeah, what kind of, you come up with whatever metaphors you want to describe how this thing feels. This is an incredible piece of, of wall painting. Um, and we can zoom in here on like something like the way, so that's classic line quality maybe as, as people were taught in school except you have a crazy interplay between the background and the, and the, you know, drawing with white on a dark field is not a, a common intuition, right? That's the reverse of, of, of how we think of an implement as making a mark. So, so this kind of turns things on its head. Um, so that's one thing to consider. And then, and then just look at the light, the, the brightness of the white versus the grayness of the white on a, on a red field. So that's kind of a classic, um, line quality moment so here are these copy books so this is um this is a copy book from i believe the middle middle ages and you you learn how to you know teaches you how to do this in a in a in a book and this is from a book from the same time by somebody who used clearly used a copy book that was similar to that so this is just kind of again bringing up um uh yeah following a form so so during class i showed the uh this clarinetist um clarinetist um, following the form of a uh, of a text of, of, of a written music manuscript and this is again a, a copy book a, a thing to follow a form to follow so I just want to I want to make the subtle and difficult to describe leap between copying something you're looking at and copying something in your mind and what that can look like in terms of line um, this is Philip Gustin uh, an, an artist who had an, uh, who yeah a wonderful artist and um, uh, lived in New York, I think. And uh, this is after making a lot of abstract paintings out of abstract expressionism. And what kind of line quality is this? And and um, there's something about it that reminds me of Teotihuacan in the line quality. And uh, there's a there's a kind of I don't want to say freedom, but a 
a tangibility, uh, a goofiness, uh, a playfulness, watching something come alive, watching something become form, maybe being able to do it again. Um, I'm not really sure how to talk about it. Maybe it has to do with this, like where is the referent in his in his mind when he goes to draw these things? And how much does it change as it gets drawn? Like maybe it has to do with watching yourself make something. What kind of line quality do you have when you watch it get made? Um, it's gonna be a very different line quality from, from um from not paying that much attention to the moment of making it to just to just trying to copy something that's out there. Um, this is another, uh, these are Etruscan paintings again, just kind of showing, uh, it's actually hard to find good, good photographs of the Etruscan works. These are from a, a book of mine. Um, I'll just show one more painting, but that's really, I'll just end on this one. So I think that that's 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 about what I what I wanted to get at. Um, it's a subtle idea, and and uh, but I think it really opens up opens up artwork um, for us.